okay um well uh, we have had some detailed discussions about the history of pawnee government from ancient times up to the present and so uh that's kind of where we started and i think we've all enjoyed getting together to talk about aspects of pawnee history and as far as i'm concerned we're all here to learn and so everybody's welcome to chime in to ask questions to make points to offer opinions so we're all here together to talk about this um, and so we're just going to play it by ear how things go in that regard Thanks to everybody for joining in tonight. I wanted to talk about uh, some aspects of Pawnee cosmology. Now, this is a topic that I'm not my, very knowledgeable about, but I think it's really interesting, especially uh, when it comes to thinking about giving uh, some contemplation towards women's status in the Pawnee world. And a place to start in my mind is to give thought to issues of Pawnee cosmology, the celestial world, the ideas that existed, have existed in Pawnee land about the nature of the universe and that sort of thing. I think this is one place to start in trying to frame the issues that we would consider in thinking about the women's world in Bonnie land. And so I uh, am hopeful that this is just maybe at uh, this meeting we can just explore some of these things because I've got more questions than answers about all this myself, and I think I'm curious to hear what other people might want to chime in about, either observations or questions. But the place I wanted to start is with uh, a particular celestial divinity that uh, is popularly known as Evening Star. Now, when we think about issues of nationhood and of national identity, we can look around in our own world and see versions of ideas that people have about what constitutes a national identity. And so I think this is an important discussion and it has uh, very nebulous boundaries and people can bring their own opinions, their own levels of knowledge. But when we think about what it means to be an American, we look around at the nature of public discourse today. Well, right now, all over the news, we can see a couple of different positions that are very clear and have been for a while. One is that we can compose a narrative of America as an oppressive, racist nation with a legacy that's very problematic. Another narrative that we can frame about the nature of being American is that America was once great, the greatest nation on earth with public institutions and social structures that the world admires. And so both of these kinds of narratives can go into the meanings that we construct about what it means to be an American. What does it mean? How do we define that? Sometimes definitions are elusive, but narratives always matter. And so in Pawnee land, when we think about what is a Pawnee, what is Pawnee land, then I think cosmology, 
the nature of the universe is a good place to start, but it's not the only discussion we can have. Infinite discussions, we can have lots of opinions about this too. And it all goes into what we would talk about when we try to get at this issue. What is a Pawnee? You know, if you just asked me that question, I just would say flat out, I don't know. And so that's why it's important to construct narratives to do storytelling. Because when we do that, we are touching base on all kinds of places where we can address that question, the mystery of what it is to be Pawnee. So that's why I thought maybe after we've outlined Pawnee governance that maybe we could touch on cosmology even though it's not my expertise. I'm not an expert. I'm probably going to say a lot of things tonight that I regret because I don't know this material well. But I think I wanted to continue thinking about women's status in the Pawnee world. And I wanted to start with this divinity, this celestial figure that is popularly known as Evening Star. Now in Pawnee thinking that's that's not the right name at all. That's not a name at all. That's a way of talking about this celestial cosmic figure that has become established. It's a narrative. But what did the Bonnies think when they thought about this? This group of ideas that we subsume into the idea of morn, morning star and evening star and these other terms. Now, the actual Pawnee name um, for this divinity, it doesn't mean evening star, it means something else. And I've seen several versions of this name. One version I do not pronounce, but it's translated as bright star. Now, I think that um, that is uh, probably a very acceptable way to think of it. Now, I haven't looked into this component of brightness. I haven't looked very much into that, but this figure in part has to do with the nature of the night sky and the way that this star flickers. There's an important ceremonial activity that happens that reflects this flickering of this stellar deity. In one ceremony, um, women are dancing to embody this flickering in the night sky of this divinity. And so this name brightness, the, the term for brightness, I haven't looked and tried to figure out what can be said about that, but it's an important term in this word. Now, the, I think the more established way to think about this is through this other term. I'm going to try to pronounce it. Um, I wish we had an expert on the language here. Maybe Deb knows uh, better, but it's something like um, Jupiter Taka. That word means the first part refers to a woman, a female. The second part refers to a star and the final part is the color white a female star white white star that is sort of the literal translation of these terms so you can see evening is not in there and so it's become common to say evening star if people use that term fine that's 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 perfectly appropriate because that's usage today 
I think if you go in the Pawnee land and you ask people, what can you say about woman star white? They might not know what you're talking about, which is kind of sad and something that I think uh, when we have meetings like this, whether it's two, three of us or 300 of us, we must do our best to try to figure out some of these esoteric details that are difficult to get at, but are very important, I think. And so, evening star, bright star, woman white star, these terms, well, what do they refer to? In Pawnee cosmology and I think this is uh, most carefully recorded and set forth in skeedy oral traditions through the labors of James R. Murray between about 1896 and his death in 1920, he kept working on these ideas. He worked with a number of anthropologists along the way and created all kinds of material, publications, manuscripts, recordings. He did recordings. And he left a very uh, deep legacy of thinking it wasn't his work. What he did is he talked to the different Pawnee priests. Now, in talking about the history of Pawnee governance and what happened in the Pawnee world at this time, and then I think we can speculate fairly as to the reasons for these different priests to sit down with James R. Murray and to share what they knew and to take part in his ambitious project to record the Pawnee world. And so Skeedy traditions, he, he was the Skeedy and that mattered to him. He had access, great access to the Skeedy priesthood and they took him in the end, and ultimately he became, through these sharings of teachings, he became a kudos, a skeedy priest himself. And so at some point, it's kind of interesting to see as he's working with different scholars at some point, you know, he's working with priests, he's recording, textual materials. And then at some point he's speaking with authority as a priest himself because he's learned this material. This is how the priesthood works. One of the persons he worked with, his name was, well, it's translated as Roaming Scout. Roaming Scout as a young man, he was born about 1839 in Eskidi City. And he was born into a priestly family. And he talks about how one of his grandfathers took him in hand at a young age. But what really happened is he got interested in the family heritage of priesthood. And so he sat down with his relatives, older relatives and older priests in general. And he spent years learning the songs, learning the ceremonies learning the, stare, the stories, he became an expert 
roaming scout. Now, I think it was probably during the 1880s when he assumed his own place as a leading skeety priest, 1880s, so he would have been in his 40s, maybe. Not an old man, but a lot of people had died already. And he had this knowledge. And so one of the things that he did when he sat down with James R. Murray, he took Murray in hand and he imparted to him a lot of things and made him sort of an apprentice, I guess you'd say, a student. And Murray earned a PhD in Bonnie Land the right way by talking to these elders, different ones. Now, one of the first big projects he did was working with an anthropologist named Alice Fletcher. Alice Fletcher brought Roaming Scout and James R. Murray to Washington, D.C. on occasion. She worked for the Bureau of American Ethnology. And so I think it was in the fall of 1901 they went there and Roaming Scout wanted to talk. Well, he was nervous about doing what he was doing. But one morning he came downstairs from where they were staying in Alice Fletcher's house. He came downstairs, he was happy. And he said, I had a dream. And this dream tells me it's okay what I'm doing here. Sharing this knowledge. And so they worked I don't know, for a week, I don't know how long it was, to record a ceremony that had last been practiced, last been held during the 1860s when Roaming Scout was a young man, as far as I can tell. He was the only living priest around 1900 who knew anything about this ceremony. Now, he called it a name that I don't know if this uh, was an official name, Ceremony of the Star of the West. I think there's something really beautiful about that. And I feel very touched. To speak about that. Fletcher wrote down a lot of notes. She published a couple of short papers that drew on this information. But her manuscripts wound up in the National Anthropological Archives and I don't think very many people have seen it, but I was there one time. I became aware of this manuscript. I ordered a copy of it when I got it. The papers, you know, I couldn't make heads or tails of them. The papers were a jumble of papers. And I, I don't know if that's the way Fletcher deposited this material or if researchers subsequent hands had gone through and shuffled things around by accident or if it was a consequence of the photocopying when they prepared it and sent it to me but every so often i get out those papers and think wow what is this i don't know and i didn't even know it was roaming scout for a long time I thought it was a Chawi priest who also worked with Fletcher during this time. Fletcher and Miri. But 
I got it out. I finally got it out uh, just a couple of years ago. And I thought, well, I'm going to make sense out of this material. And I sorted through it. And I realized that the papers had gotten jumbled somehow. And I thought, oh, I'm going to sit down and just sort them out as best as I can based on all the internal evidence I can. So I sorted out all these papers into, uh, I think, uh, 10 or 11 different groupings of papers. And I found in those papers that this was a manuscript of notes. These were the notes that Fletcher prepared working with Murray, translating roaming scouts sayings on the ceremony of the Star of the West, as he called it. Now, Murray later, uh, he came up with another name for this ceremony called the Four Poles Ceremony, and he wrote about it, uh, just a synthesis, a few pages in Ceremonies of the Pawnee. That's where you can read about the Four Poles Ceremony, and I think it's his synthesis of what he had learned working with Roaming Scout. Now, this ceremony, the Star of the West, is the star we're talking about. And this ceremony was a central ceremony to the political religious confederacy that I call the Skeedy Federation, founded in ancient times. And this ceremony was the unifying annual ceremony of this group last held during the 1860s. It wasn't quashed by American missionaries, by American military officials, by American political decisions made in far off Washington. I don't know why they stopped holding this ceremony. But the Skeedy Federation and its ceremonies, its structures, its purposes were replaced by the Pawnee Confederation, a new system, I think inspired in some part by the structures of the Skeedy Federation. Nevertheless, here we have this ceremony. It's all about this, uh, this star that we're talking about, a female star in the sky. Now, in the stories and the ceremonies, long ago, the first man, as he's called, the holy person, wonderful person, closed man, whatever the name is, these, all these names apply in different ways. When he started the Skeedy Federation, there were various communities all around the region. And off to the west, there were four communities. They each had a bundle. And these four communities, they came and joined in the doings that had to do with the founding of this new political religious system, the Skeedy Federation. And they played a leading role. These four communities, they had this bundle. And we know it today as the Evening Star Bundle. This bundle was the founding instrument of the Skeedy Federation. It was very important. Now these four communities, they ultimately consolidated in the course of these doings into one community. I don't know how to pronounce that in Pawnee, but the translation is ancient town 
old village is what you'll see. I prefer ancient town. And so this community, they were to the west of where the center town was, where these doings were happening. Where in the west? Well, that's not real clear exactly. The tradition says they were in the west. But it so happens that roaming scout, when he talked about his life, he said, I was born at Old Town, Old Village, ancient, the ancient town. He was born there. And so here's what happened. The Skeeties established this metropolitan city at this one location. And I think it was the location where these ancient doings of old village had happened, the ancient town. And they took that name there. And so it's known today in Nebraska archaeology as the Palmer site in Howard County. The Palmer site is Old Town. That's the skeety name for this. Now, Old Town, by the time it was founded, and I'm not sure when that was, it might have been in the 1780s, and it was occupied up to till about 1840, 1842. They took on this name. And so this was, I think, a deliberate action on the part of the founders of this community. They drew together all the skeeties, the bands, the skeedy, Akitaru, Bands, villages, whatever you'd call them. Some people say clans. And by this point in time, I don't know how many there are. 15 to 18 to in the low 20s. These are each communities that were part of the Skeedy Federation. And now... Um, by the end years of the occupation of this Skeedy city where Roaming Scout was born in 1839. Now we have basically four Skeedy groups that are still active. They still have populations there. They've absorbed the others. And so you have, you know, the priesthood and the leaders the Risaru, from all these different groups, subgroups among the Skeeti, but now they're integrated into four groups and they're divided into two subgroupings, two, I don't know, alliances. So there are basically two different groups of Skeetis and each one is absorbed you know, different numbers of these other groups. So they have families, a family that is descended from antiquity. They're holders of this bundle from one of these ancient Skeedy communities. But as they set up here, I think at this location, and I think it was, I would, I'm speculating, but I think it's the location of this ancient town, one of the largest cities in the region. It wasn't a village. It wasn't a hamlet. It was a city. It had neighborhoods. It had subdivisions, you know, political units, subunits that were each governed separately came together into the federation system on various occasions. So this was a skeedy metropolitan center. 
on the many wild potatoes river in the ancient Pawnee homeland. I think they did this to recognize the status and the role of this star we're talking about tonight. Female white star, woman white star, evening star, bright star. And so what I'm saying is this is an important figure, not a minor divinity in storytelling, but a central figure in what it means to be a skeety. So I started off talking about what is identity, what is American identity. Well, part of the answer circa 1839 for what it meant to be a skeedy was it had to do with his cosmology it had to do with the evening star storytelling not just storytelling but rituals songs the ways of mother corn all of these things, the politics bound up in the symbolism, the imagery of this celestial figure. And so this is a central idea, not a peripheral one in Pawnee land. Now, what did it mean to the skeety women of that time? I don't know, but it's an interesting question to ask. And I think that this is a, a project that deserves a lot more thought than, than most Bonnies give it today. Now we have this vast project that James R. Murray launched into working with Bonnie Priest, as far as I can tell, there weren't any women priests. They were all men. And so Mary talked to both men and women and recorded information, but women weren't in the priesthood, but they were parts of the leading families in the community with their status, their situations set forth in the cosmology, the mythology, the public narratives of what it meant to be a skeedy. And so Evening Star is in there. Now, I'm not talking about the Southman's here. But the South Bands also had these the same divinities. They shared a lot of this, the narrative making, the, the myth making, the sense of community and identity. They shared that too. I don't know the differences how the stories differ. I haven't sat down to compare closely so I can speak with any authority about it. But I think all the Bonnies were neighbors for so long. They, they intermarried them. They attended each other's ceremonies. They shared stories. And so there's a lot of overlap among all the Pawnees, but there are differences too. So I've been focusing on the Skeeties and how things differed among the South Bend Pawnees is an interesting question to keep in mind. So in any case, when we look at what Alice Fletcher did, working with Muri and with Roaming Scout and setting down these notes about the ceremony of the Star of the West. 
we get glimpses of the status of Bonnie women in the Bonnie world. Not a very coherent set of uh, insights, but still, I think we can learn some interesting things. And so Evening Star, Bright Star, female star white this divinity is something to think about when we want to figure out where to start thinking about the history of women's status in the Bonnie world so i just wanted to open with this now i haven't really touched on mother corn but mother corn can't be understood unless you start with this divinity because in the cosmology she had a garden and this garden is where mother corn came from and so she is the original herself mother corn and so all of the little details the imagery the symbolism that we can talk about it traces back to this divinity in this figure and there are others that we can talk about too to get a broader picture from many angles of the cosmology that is centered on women in the Pawnee world all that is pretty much gone today I don't really know. I think if we had an audience of, you know, 2,000 ponies right now, they could all chime in. They might tell me I'm wrong about that. They spend a lot of time talking about Evening Star. They have doings. They, they all know who she is. So I could be wrong about this. But the ceremony of the Star of the West has not been practiced for 150, 160 years now. So how can she be at the center of Bonnie land today? She isn't, but I don't think she's gone either. So that's what I wanted to open up with talking about the women's world in Pawnee land. So thanks.